Okay, today we're going to talk about science and the news. Because in reality, um, part of this class is, um, the purpose of part of this class is not just to teach you material or content, but also to teach you how to be a critical thinker. And honestly, if that's all you left this class with, um, the university may not be happy, but I would be happy because this is one of the most important skills that you can have because there's so much out there um, that will uh, try to lead you to believe something um, with no basis in fact. And understanding what reality is and what science says and what facts are um, is really, really important, especially now in today's day and age. And so the question that we're going to ask today is, can science reporting um, be trusted? So you may have seen um, something like this somewhere on the internet where the root cause of obesity, avoid these four toxic foods. Researchers have discovered the real cause of obesity and digestive issues in America. Avoid eating these four foods. You'll be surprised by food number three right and then they're showing picture of you know two eggs frying in a pan probably in some sort of uh, oil or butter um or who which is the world health organization confirms eating meat causes cancer but how did this once healthy food become so deadly or green office may boost brain power I have to say that my mom actually uh, called me about this and she's like, you spend so much time in your office. Uh, I saw on Facebook, which, you know, is always a great source. I saw on Facebook uh, that a green office will make your uh, brain work better. So I'm going to send you a plant. I was like, mommy, do not send me a plant because I kill everything that I have ever tried to grow. Uh, so now I'm just going to have a dead plant on my hands. Um, also, it's not true. She's like, but it said. I'm like, but it's a lie. There's nowhere in the world that uh, researchers found that having plants in your office will boost your brain power. So we're going to focus on one uh, part, uh, one headline in particular, the one about uh, the World Health Organization saying that uh, meat causes cancer. Why? Because uh, I love meat. Uh, in fact, I love bacon specifically. Um, I grew up Jewish, and so I didn't uh, eat bacon or any pork products growing up, uh, but now I do. Um, and I can tell you that since the day I started eating bacon, uh, I've kind of not stopped because bacon just makes everything better. And so when uh, my students in my past university that knew this, when they that headline came out, they sent it to me. They're like, oh my God, you see, you're going to get cancer. And I was like, oh Lord, now I have to break this down and show you that it's not true. So that headline went viral at the time. This is when 20, in 2015. And it went with bacon, hot dogs, and processed meat cause cancer, World Health Organization says. The Guardian, which is a legitimate news organization, uh, under the... Um, under the cancer section, right? So like, this is a, a scary a part of their website. Processed meats rank alongside smoking as cancer causes, the World Health Organization says. UN Health Body says bacon, sausages, and ham among most carcinogenic substances, along with cigarettes, alcohol, asbestos, and arsenic. Or processed meat do cause cancer. It's official. Official, y'all. Bacon, hot dogs, and other processed meat cause cancer. Hamburgers probably do too, according to the World Health Organization. Wow. So after reading all those headlines, you might be like, well, I'm going vegan because that was intense. I don't want to get cancer, so I'm going to stop eating all meats. Uh it got worse because then it was picked up on Pinterest, right? And everyone is posting, it's official, bacon and sausage cause cancer and are as dangerous as cigarettes. Of course, promoting their website. Or Twitter, how bacon kills. This is from Time Magazine, the science behind how bacon causes cancer. 
And my favorite, because PETA, for nothing else, is super witty and creative, if you want to give them credit for that, um, bacon-wrapped cancer, right? Super catchy headline. And so let's focus on this a little more. The headline is World Health Organization confirms eating meat causes cancer, but how did this once healthy food become so deadly? So of course, I wanted to keep eating meat and I wanna know if I'm gonna get cancer. And so I read the actual academic journal article that was published in The Lancet. The Lancet is the premier medical journal in Europe. This is amazingly difficult to get published in this journal. It is very prestigious uh, and essentially it doesn't publish bullshit. So that's the short of it. And so what I, when I found the article, it was published in Lancet, I was impressed and I was like, okay, well, this is a top tier medical journal. Uh, let's see what it says. And I found that the study stated that they found a relationship between processed red meat and bowel cancer. First of all, before reading this article, I had never even heard of bowel cancer. I'm not going to lie. I've heard of lots of different types of cancers, but never did I think about bowel cancer. And so that was news to me. And the key here is the word relationship. So I don't know if you remember when we talked about um, uh, correlations, right? But this is an association claim. This is a, a, a correlational claim. They're just finding a relationship between eating processed red meat and bowel cancer. And their conclusion was eating red meat is associated, associated, correlational, with a 17% increased risk of developing bowel cancer. Okay, so that certainly doesn't sound like a good thing, but let's break it down. So let's look at the rate of bowel cancer. In the UK, where the study was done, the average rate of bowel cancer is 61 in 1,000 people. So you have about a 6.1% chance or risk of getting bowel cancer if you live in the UK. An increase of 17% means that for people who consistently eat processed red meat, the rate is 66 out of 1,000 making it a 6.6% chance. So the likelihood of bowel cancer increases at an actual effective rate of half a percent. So that doesn't sound so scary now, does it? Right, it sounds significantly less scary. But let's take it a little further. So if the average rate in the UK is 61 out of 1,000, a 6.1% rate, they found that those eating a diet high in processed meat had a 66 out of 1,000 or 6.6% risk. What about those that don't eat processed meat? Those that have a diet low in processed meat where they only eat it once in a while. They had a 56 out of 1,000 rate of having bowel cancer, suggesting that even those that go uh, without eating processed meat or eat it uh, very uh, sporadically have a 5.6% risk. So even if we compare the low eaters of processed meat and the high eaters of processed meat, you only have a difference of 1% greater risk. And People who don't eat the processed meat still get this bowel cancer 5.6% of the time, making it inaccurate to claim that processed meat causes cancer. Additionally, and very frighteningly, the study didn't even take into account any other risk factors, such as the rest of your diet, right? We know that if, let's say you just eat processed red meat and Skittles, well, if you don't eat enough vegetables, if you don't eat a, a balanced diet, then you are at higher risk for particular types of cancers. If this study did not take into account exercise, which is one of the best ways to maintain health, family history, aka genetics, right? We know that most cancers, not all, but most cancers are highly genetic, as is bowel cancer, come to find out. 
or whether you have any other cancers because having one cancer makes you susceptible to uh, getting other cancers. So I, I wanna note here before I go on, this study didn't do anything wrong. It's a good, solid study. They measured the rate of bowel cancer and measured how much meat people eat, and they reported that. And so they didn't do anything wrong. This was an amazingly good study. However, the headline stating that uh, meat causes cancer is the problem. Okay? So it's not that the study did anything wrong. It's the reporting of the study that did something wrong. So in order to understand what went wrong here, let's talk about the process of science. Okay? So imagine this circle contains all of human knowledge okay everything that we know in the world every book journal article study every tidbit of real information fits into this circle by the time you finish elementary school you know a little bit about a lot right you have math and science and and history uh english you know a little bit once you finish high school you expand your knowledge a little bit more right about all things. Then you go to college. If you get a bachelor's degree or with your bachelor's degree, you have uh, general knowledge about lots of things, right? We make you take math, we make you take uh, a science. So you have a general education. And then this little pimple looking thing is your specialty, is your major. So for us, it would be, let's say, psychology, right? And so you know a lot about all these things, and then you know a little bit more about psychology. Assume you get a master's degree on psychology or whatever your topic is, you're deepening your knowledge just of that specialty, right? You, when you go to uh, grad school, you don't have to take general education courses. You only have to take courses in the topic uh, that you're interested in learning. And then let's say you read research papers and you take that master's degree even further and you want to get a PhD and so you're taking your knowledge to the edge of what we know about that topic. So it goes all the way, you learned all the things and if you go to grad school you'll learn that you're going to read so much. And once you're on that boundary you learned everything that there is to know that you can possibly found, find about that topic, you focus and you push on that boundary for years. And then finally, you make a dent. This dent is called a PhD or a study or a, a research article. What you've essentially done is created information. You've created knowledge and it's amazing. Look at this wonderful little pimple. It's so beautiful to you, right? And it's great because you've expanded knowledge. However, if we take this back and compare that little tiny zit to all of the human knowledge bubble that we started off with, that little bubble represents one experiment. And this is important because when we interpret the meaning or significance of this tiny single experiment, right, we're making and we make generalizations about all of human knowledge, we are essentially making this tiny little bubble, this tiny little zit, represent more than it actually does. One study just expands our knowledge by this much. It does not impact everything about our human knowledge. So saying that there's a correlation, a relationship between bowel cancer and processed meat is just this much info. And it's useful info and it's amazing info, but it shouldn't pretend that it's making up more knowledge than it is that it's making up more knowledge of this circle okay so let's use a psychology example so um a few years ago my students sent me another article called science says snapchat makes you happy and um at the time i was very resistant of using snapchat i avoided it and my students really wanted me to get on it they're like oh we can send you snaps and you can use these filters and i was like uh, I don't want to send snaps with you. I don't want to know what's going on in your day. No thanks, right? And so then they sent me this. 
Um, and they're like, see, science says Snapchat makes you happy. So therefore, you should download Snapchat. And I was like, you guys know that by sending this to me, now I have to break your hearts and show you how that that's not what it says. So here we go. So science says Snapchat makes you happy is the news article headline. I found the actual journal article um, and it reads sharing the small moments, ephemeral social interaction on Snapchat. Okay. And this is the abstract. The abstract of a paper gives you the summary of the entire article. So in about 500 words or less, they have to uh, summarize the entire article um, so that you can read just a snapshot of it. And their conclusions from this abstract is Snapchat interactions are perceived as more enjoyable and associated with positive, more positive mood and also associated with lower social support. Snapchat was viewed as a lightweight channel for sharing spontaneous experiences with trusted ties. So this sounds much less like science, uh, Snapchat makes you happy. So let's delve into it a little deeper. What did this experiment actually study? They tested 154 undergraduates from the University of Michigan. The student body that they tested was 67% female, 74% white, 23% were uh, active in Greek life, and 87% reported that their parents have a college degree. So really quickly, just for a second, think about what might be a problem, or not a problem, but like something to think about or notice about this population. What you should be thinking of is that this population may not necessarily be representative of the general population, right? This sample is not necessarily true for making a claim about all people, right? Because the general population is not 74% white, is not 67% female, and 87% of them do not have a college degree, suggesting that this family, uh, this, this sample had families that were of higher uh, quote unquote intelligence than maybe the average uh, household. Now, what did this study do? They had a baseline questionnaire uh, for mood and, and social media use. Then for 14 days, they had them um, uh, fill out a survey via text message uh, about their smartphone use. And so six times per day, the students were asked via text message four simple questions. One, how did your most recent social interaction occur? Was it face-to-face, -face, phone call, text, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, etc.? How pleasant or unpleasant was that interaction on a scale of one to five? How supportive or unsupportive was the person that you interacted with on a scale of one to five? And how close are you to that person on a scale of one to five? So first thing I want you to notice is that none of these questions talk about happiness. It was just how pleasant or unpleasant was the interaction, how supportive or unsupportive, and how close you are, just to keep in mind. Now, data was gathered from these participants, and they gathered over 11,000 social interactions across these two weeks, which is kind of amazing. Only 204 of these 11,000 interactions were Snapchat interactions. So to make the claim, even if, even if this study found that Snapchat made you happier, it was only talking about a fraction of overall social interactions. And so we could not make the claim that using Snapchat makes you happy all the time because these participants were not using Snapchat very often. So what did they find? You don't have to figure out how to read this. I'll explain it. So in this box right here, this line is Snapchat. And any data to the left of this line is less than Snapchat. Anything to the right of this line is more than Snapchat. And this is for social enjoyment and social supportiveness for each um, uh, social media that they, uh, or interaction type that they measured. So this is Instagram, Twitter is the blue, Facebook is the dark blue, email is red, texting is orange, calling is green, and face-to-face -face is this purple. And without having to go over this, 
Snapchat, the, what the results were that Snapchat provides greater social enjoyment than email, texting, and calling. Who emails you? The answer is me, right? School emails you. Bills email you. No one interacts socially via email. It's not like I'm going to like, hey, I really want to talk to my best friend. I'm going to send her an email. That's weird. Who texts you? Probably your mom, your dad. Who calls you? Probably your grandparents, right? Who Or bill collectors. Uh, the school calls you. Um, so it's not surprising that Snapchat, this social media uh, platform is much more enjoyable um, than those three. However, Snapchat was not more enjoyable than Instagram, Twitter, surprising, and face-to-face, -face, which gave me kind of hope. With regard to social supportiveness, what it found was is that everything but Instagram provided more social support um, than Snapchat. Every entity other than Instagram, which went a little less than Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, email, texting, calling, and face-to-face -face provided more social support than Snapchat did. With regard to emotional valence, um, uh, an emotional arousal, what they essentially found was Snapchat was more positive than Facebook, not surprising given how political Facebook has become, emailing, again, who emails you, and texting, which was a little surprising. But Snapchat was not more positive than Instagram, Twitter, surprising, and face-to-face, -face, which, again, gave me some hope for uh, society, uh, that we still enjoy face-to-face -face interaction, especially now that we can't have it. So anywhere in here, do you see happiness? Do you see, oh, Snapchat makes you a happier person? Snapchat was just more positive than Facebook email and texting, but it, nowhere does it say that you felt happier. So conclusion is Snapchat provides short-term boosts of positivity and is more enjoyable than Facebook email, phone calls, and texting. That's it. Nowhere does it say that science says Snapchat makes you happy. Again, I want to stress that there's nothing wrong with this research. It's good work, and it's focused on an interesting and emerging topic of studying social media. It works, okay? But it is not trying to say, nor does it say, that Snapchat makes you happy. Um, this says in-class activity. Delete that from your mind. Uh, for um, homework, uh, you are going to read, uh, science says those who watch Grays or Mad Men are better people. Um, and uh, then you are going to read the journal article that is associated with this uh, to uh, um, see the, break, the, the difference between the uh, media article and the journal article. But before we do that, I just want to go over what a journal article includes because a journal article has very specific standardized sections. And so it's important for you to know what each section includes in order for you to have an understanding of what you're reading. Because if you've never read a journal article, they're not fun. In fact, you're gonna hate me and that's okay. Um, but journal articles are really good for relating scientific information because they take away any and all emotions and any and all opinion. A journal article does not put their opinion, does not put their emotions, does not put politics, does not put uh, any skew. It just talks about the data, which makes it really boring and terrible to read, but also really informative. Okay. So the sections of the paper are introduction, method, results, and discussion. And the introduction starts very general, then gets very specific. Your method and results are very specific to your, to the study that you're reading. And then the discussion ends a little more general and talks about not just your study or the study that you're reading, but also in general, the, the topic. Okay, so let's talk about each one of these individually. The introduction. The purpose of the introduction is to tell the reader the theory behind the current research and what previous research has already been done about this topic. 
Essentially, it gives all the background information that a reader might need. It defines key terms and tries to explain competing theories if there are any. And it always ends with the researcher's hypothesis. Okay. Now, I want to note, some parts might be confusing and not relevant, but you should be able to get through it and understand the main objectives, specifically what are the key terms and what is the research hypothesis, okay? You might have to reread some parts and that's okay. It takes practice. When I tell you that reading journal articles is boring, I'm not kidding. Um, and because it's boring, your mind might read it and then your brain just glosses over the material. It's okay to reread parts. The method section then tells the reader the who, what, where, and how of the experiment. So the introduction ended with what study or what the research that they were going to do, what their hypotheses are. The method section talks about how they're going to actually test their uh, research question. So it tells them, it tells you, the reader, um, kind of like in a recipe format, uh, the who, what, where, and how it tells you the number of people tells you what they did and what tools they used tells you what data was collected and the steps that they took again some of it might be a little confusing while you're reading it try to walk away from the method section with only an understanding of what the experiment had the participants do what data was collected what were the different groups okay and then the results section this will be the most difficult section because this is the results part where it talks about the statistics uh, that they ran in order to analyze their data. You probably may not understand any of the numbers or the statistics, and that's kind of okay. Um, if, you, if they're talking about um, stats that you understand, awesome. If they don't, it's okay. Try to read the results section and focus on the numbers um, that uh, are means um, and um, uh, between the groups. Try to focus on understanding the outcome of the study in general. Use the graphs or the tables that they provide you to interpret their findings. So if you see their analyses and you're like, I have no idea what any of these means, focus on the means. Sometimes summarizes M. Um, the mean, you all know since, I don't know, elementary school, hopefully, right? So you can look at the different groups and just look at the means of the different groups, and that'll tell you uh, what the results are. Now, luckily, the results are interpreted. All those stats are interpreted in the discussion section. So the discussion section tells the reader in general terms what the results are, and they summarize the findings, relating it back to their hypotheses. So the discussion section has multiple parts it's the summary of the findings which again will help you understand the results in a less statistical form uh, it gives you possible extensions for future work problems with the current study and it tells you why is it important what does the study tell us and how you should interpret it in light of all of the research okay and so the question with that assignment was, do they ever make the claim that fictional TV shows make you smarter? That's the question for that particular assignment. Um, one thing about that study uh, that uh, you're going to read that I want to talk about is the research focuses on the relationship between watching fictional drama TV, such as Mad Men, uh, Game of Thrones, and a specific cognitive ability called theory of mind. I don't think we talked about theory of mind yet, so I'm just going to uh, uh, explain what it is. So theory of mind is this awareness of and the ability to interpret the mental states of other people. Essentially, it's knowing that you're, you have a mind that is separate from others. Okay, so let's say, um, I don't know, the new iPhone just dropped and uh, my iPhone sucks, so I'm in line uh, to get it and they say that they only have one left and somebody's walking towards the counter to buy it and I see them, right? Well, someone's walking towards the counter and they just announced that there's only one left. I can make the assumption that this person is walking towards the counter to try and buy the last iPhone, but that's what I want. And so I am making an assumption about what's in that other person's mind. 
right? That is theory of mind, where I know that my mind is separate than theirs, and they have intentions and desires that are different than mine. Okay. And this makes sense to study in terms of fictional TV because fiction TV is about these social complex relationships, right? Which use theory of mind. Uh, so maybe their rationale would be that maybe watching a sitcom instead of a documentary, for example, provides some boost to theory of mind abilities. And they test theory of mind in children using what we call the Sally Ann task. This is very simple. They tell the child the story like this. This is Sally, and this is Anne. Sally has a ball. She puts the ball into her basket. Sally goes out for a walk. Anne, sneaky little Anne, takes the ball out of the basket and puts the ball into her box. And she leaves. Now Sally comes back. She wants to play with her ball. Where will Sally look for the ball? So where will Sally look for the ball? You should say the basket. Why? Because that's where she last put it. But where is the ball? The box. Children that don't have theory of mind yet, because it doesn't develop usually until around the age of three, will say the box. Why? Because they know it's in the box. And because they don't have theory of mind, they don't understand that their mind is separate from everybody else's mind. So if they know it to be in the box, everyone thinks it's in the box, okay? And so we all as adults understand this already. So in adults, we measure theory of mind with this reading of the minds of the eyes test, which is we can look at eyes and the eyes tell us about what other people are thinking. And sometimes it's very simple and sometimes it's not. So uh, in this example, this is just uh, 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 a test and an easy one, right? Does this person look worried or friendly? And the answer is that they look worried. And this one, do they look fantasizing or alarmed? And this one's a little more ambiguous. It's very difficult to tell whether this person is alarmed, meaning that they want to kill somebody. It's almost like an angry alarmed or fantasizing like they want somebody uh, uh, physically, sexually or something. Right. And so you usually get about 60, 40 here. So it's not as clear as worried versus friendly in this example. And so this is the task that they used in that study. OK, so now you should have a pretty good uh, idea of um, why you should question journal articles versus media critiques um, and uh, why you should critique the media uh, in terms of how they report things um, and be prepared to do this one assignment. If you have any questions, let me know.